Today, I'm gonna to show you how to build a network attached storage device so you can store all the files on your network out of nothing but old discarded components. Stay tuned. I have no shortage of old outdated computers laying around my shop. And unfortunately, a lot of these computers simply won't run Windows 10. I could probably put a lightweight Linux distribution on them and make a workstation out of them. However, I thought for this video, one of the best ways to make use of an old computer is to build a file server. Now, I'm definitely not having a shortage on hard drives. This is just a sample of some of the used drives that I have laying around. And this is just one of several boxes. So what I did was I picked out some really good drives. I tried to match them. So I got four one terabyte drives that we're gonna use in this build. And for the system itself, I pieced this one together out of just parts that I had laying around. The case is just a generic case. It's a case that I pulled out of a used computer and I gutted all the parts out of it in order to put what I wanted inside of it. Now inside the case, we have an AMD 760G chipset. This is an AM3 motherboard, so it takes DDR3. I've got 12 gigs of DDR3 in this thing, so obviously this is a really outdated system. I believe the processor in this thing is an Athlon 2 X4 running at three gigahertz. So it's probably not gonna be the best system to run Windows 10. It would probably do it, but it wouldn't be a fun computer to use. So what I plan on using for this build is an operating system called Exi Exima <laughs> Exigma Mass or Exi Exig Exigma Nas. Why can't you guys name your program something that can easily be pronounced? Seriously. <laughs> the operating system that I plan on using for this build is an operating system called Exigma Nas or something like that. Honestly, I can't pronounce it. And it would be really nice if they just stuck with the name they had before. Before they were called NAS for free. They were a fork of FreeNAS. FreeNAS used to be a great operating system to make use of old hardware. Unfortunately, FreeNAS has grown up and it needs pretty high spec hardware nowadays. So NAS for free was a great alternative and it was based on the same code base that FreeNAS was originally based off of. They changed their name recently and I'll go ahead and put a link in the description so you can find their website. But you can still find them by searching NAS for free on Google. So there's a couple things that we have to keep in mind when we're setting this up. For one, we can easily run the operating system off of a hard drive. However, that would take up one of our SATA ports and we want to make use of our SATA ports for our storage drives. So the best way to run NAS for free is to put it on a USB drive and do an embedded install. Now, what you could easily do is just plug a USB drive into one of the USB ports and have at it. However, I really don't like that way of doing it because you have a thumb drive sticking out of a port and it's liable to get damaged. So what I typically do is I steal these little headers out of old computer cases. All this is is just a basic USB header that you can plug into the motherboard and then you just tape this thing down to the inside of the case so your USB drive can actually be in the case. So let me show you how to install this. So the way you wanna do this is you wanna look at your motherboard and find where your USB headers are at. This motherboard here has two extra headers right here on the motherboard that aren't being used. We can use either of these headers. And all you do is you take the USB header here and you plug this thing in just like that. And then once you have it plugged in, take your USB drive, plug it into the header like this, and then you can tape it down to the inside of the case. And that's all there is to it. Now the next step that we have to do is actually to install the operating system. To do that, we go ahead and go to Exigma NAS, and I know I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, website, and download the ISO image and then burn the ISO image to a CD using your favorite CD burning program. Alternatively, you could also create a USB thumb drive with the install on that too, using a program like Rufus. However, for this situation, I didn't have a spare USB drive that I wanted to burn for this, so I just went ahead and made a CD out of it. I'm gonna go ahead and install the operating system onto the USB drive first before I actually install the storage drives in the system. And it just simply makes the install simpler because there will only be one drive to install the operating system to, but it's not a necessity. That's just the way that I'm gonna do it here. So what we're gonna do is put our CD inside of our drive right here, 
and turn the computer on. And then one of the things that we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to boot this off of a, we're gonna have to tell the computer which drive to boot off of. On this motherboard, it's simply pushing the F8 key, but your motherboard might be different. So I would refer to the manufacturer's website to find out which key will allow you to get to the boot menu. So I'm gonna choose right here the CD-ROM and hit enter and then hit enter again. And now what it's gonna do is go through the boot up process from the CD. This is gonna take a minute, so I'm gonna skip ahead to when we're actually inside the installer itself. Okay, the first step that we take to install this is go ahead and push the number nine key for install upgrade from live CD. And then we're gonna to wanna to choose the embedded OS here, the first one. And then you have a couple different choices here. You can pick either a GDP or a legacy MBR style boot. So this just depends on your motherboard. If you have an EFI motherboard, then you can pick a GDP or EFI boot. If you don't, if you have an even older motherboard, you may have to pick an MBR boot. For this one here, I'm gonna pick the GDP and then hit enter and then hit okay. And then on this screen, it's gonna ask you what your CD source is. So that's your CD-ROM. And then this right here is the reason why I didn't install the storage drives ahead of time, because it's asking you where you want to install the operating system to. Now, obviously, I'm going to install it to the 8 gigabyte thumb drive, and this would be really easy to pick out from a list if we had all of our drives here, but it just makes the process a little bit more streamlined. So I'm going to hit enter here. Now we're going to give it a second and it's going to ask you the size of the OS partition. Now this one is just going to be two gigs, so we're going to hit enter. And then it's going to ask you the size of the swap partition. Now on this one right here, I'm actually going to make this one two gigs also. and then hit enter. And then it wants to know what size for your data partition. Now this data partition is gonna be for the most part worthless because we're gonna be putting all of our data on our spinning disks. However, you have to say something. So I'm just gonna hit capital A-L-L -L for all and hit enter. And now it's gonna go through the process of actually installing the operating system onto the USB thumb drive. Now this is gonna take a minute to finish. So I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward this section so we can get to the next stage. When you work on computers for a living, the one thing that you have to remember is everything takes time. And I spend the majority of my time waiting for a computer to finish doing what it's doing. It's just the way it is. All right, now that the operating system install has finished, the next thing that we need to do is shut the system down and install our hard drives. So to do that, we're gonna go ahead and push enter. Then we're gonna hit exit. And then we wanna hit number eight for shut down the server. So we hit eight and it should shut the server down. We hit yes to confirm and that's it. The server should shut down at that point and then we can install the hard drives. Now, to install the drives, what we need to do is get the drives that we intend to use. I got four one terabyte Western Digital drives. I tried to match these out of all the drives I had so I could get all the same model number drive. And you can install these any way you want. You can install them in your regular drive bays like you would normally. I went ahead and made this job a little bit easier for myself and I installed a hot swappable bay in the front right here. Now you don't have to have a bay like that in order to install these drives, but in order to keep this build pure and built off of all used parts, this bay was actually used. It came from my old file server. Now we're gonna go ahead and install these drives here into this rack. And all we have to do to do that is just open these doors up right here and we can slip the drives themselves in. Now this is the only reason why I use this rack is just to make it easier to install these drives for the purpose of this video. All I have to do is just slide them in and close the doors rather than going through the process of actually screwing all the drives in. But either way would work fine. And one of the downsides to this bay right here is that unfortunately, this thing is not quiet by any means. Take a look. 
It's really loud. And one of the reasons why I upgraded to a new file server was primarily because of the volume of this thing. This thing sat in the corner of my shop and it was just obnoxious. Now I'll go ahead and show you the file server I'm using now and you can see the difference. My current file server is a much more efficient design. This one right here still uses hot swappable racks. However, they're nowhere near as loud as the old system was. In this one, I have enough room for expansion like I didn't before. Before I could only fit four drives in the whole server. And in this one, I can actually fit 12 drives total. Currently, I have eight regular hard drives. I've got four two terabyte drives in one storage pool here, and I have four four terabyte drives in another storage pool here. I also have two SSDs that I use for write cache in order to write to the file server faster. Now there's lots of different things that you can do when you're building a file server. You don't have to build it out of used parts. You can also use higher end parts in order to get a faster file server. Inside of this one right here, this is actually using an AMD FX 6300 processor, and this one has 16 gigs of RAM. And the way I set this one up is it's actually using the onboard SATA controller as well as another standalone SATA controller that I can use to run more drives. If I wanna add another storage pool to this thing at some point, I can always add another controller so I can add more drives. And the reason why this one isn't as loud as the old one is instead of having those small high pitched fans like the other one has, this one has 320 millimeter fans sitting behind the drive racks that pull air through the front. And being that it's a rack mountable design, it makes it much more efficient when it comes to trying to keep it quiet as well as saving space. I don't have it sitting in a corner taking up space on my bench. It's sitting in this rack and all I have to do is close this door and it quiets it down really well. In fact, all the videos that I film always have these things running and you can't even hear them inside of the videos. So they actually do help to quiet my shop down quite a bit. And to be honest with you, sometimes it's worth a little bit of extra money in order to get the system to be a little bit quieter, especially for your own sanity. So now that they're all in, we go ahead and fire the system up and we're gonna have to make some changes in the BIOS real quick and I'll show you how to do that right now. Okay, now that we're in the BIOS, what we're gonna wanna do is go over to our boot settings. Your BIOS might be a little bit different, but I would refer to the manufacturer's website if you can't find this, but it should be relatively obvious. So we're gonna pick on hard disk drives here, and then we're gonna scroll down as, as you can see, all of these one terabyte Western digital drives took the first through the fourth boot order, and our USB drive is all the way at the bottom. Well, obviously we want our USB drive to be at the top. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick our USB drive and then I typically go through and I disable all of the other ones just like this. You, can't, you can do that if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, in this motherboard, there's a really weird little, I don't know if I'd call it a bug or not, but it actually goes ahead and every time you change the hard drive configuration, it resets this section inside the BIOS. So you have to go in here and change this constantly if you're replacing or changing drives ever. So if you ever have an issue, that's probably what the problem is. So we're gonna go ahead and hit escape, go to exit, exit and save changes, hit enter. So now we're gonna let the operating system boot up. And once it gets all the way booted up, there's one more change that we're gonna have to make. And I'll show you what that is now. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is to log in. And to log in, all you're gonna do is type admin, and then for the password, it's going to be the name of the operating system. So Exigma Mass, Exigma NAS, or whatever it is. So it's going to be X I G M A N A S. And that'll give us our console menu. So what we need to do here is go ahead and hit number two for configure network IP address because unfortunately this thing boots up with just a default static IP address and that's just not gonna work in this case. So we're gonna hit two and hit enter. You're gonna ask if you wanna use DHCP. We're gonna hit yes. And do you wanna configure IP version six? I'm gonna hit no. And then at this point, my router should issue this computer an IP address that we can use for the next step. And there we go, we hit enter to continue, and that's it. Now we can move on to the next step and configure our actual hard drives into a storage device that we can store files to. 
So to do that, we have to move over to a Windows computer, and we'll do that now. The next stage in this is to go to a Windows computer and log into our NAS from a browser so we can configure our hard drives. And to do that, let me show you how. So the first thing we want to do is go ahead and open up Chrome or whatever browser that you're using, and we want to enter in the IP address that we just got in the last step. So to do that, mine's going to be 192.168.0.154. And that's going to give us our login screen. Now, our login right now is just going to be admin, and the password is going to be the same as we used before. It's going to be the name of the operating system. So X I G M A NAS. And there we go. So now from here, the, so the first thing that you're going to want to do once you get logged on to the web interface is to change your password. And to do that, you go into system and you go into general, and then you're gonna to wanna to click on password right here. So the old password is gonna be X I G M A NAS. And the new password, I'm just gonna make it cyber CPU. But you obviously can make this anything that you want. But make sure it's a secure password because all your files are gonna be stored on this system. We're gonna hit save. And that's it. So now what we're gonna do is the first step that you need to take once you have, you're in the web GUI is to go into access, go into users and groups. Now what we wanna do is we wanna create ourselves a user account. So to do that, scroll all the way to the bottom and you wanna hit this little plus sign right here. And my user account is simply going to be rich. And then for password, same as before, I'm just gonna use cyber CPU. But as before, I would make sure this is a secure password because your files are going to be stored on the system. So now you're going to want to scroll down and what I'm going to do is for primary group, I'm going to choose admin and then for these groups, I'm going to check admin and then I'm going to check the wheel group because I want to be able to use this account to be able to administer the server itself. And this is essentially root access right here. So I'm going to scroll down here and I'm also going to give myself full permissions for the file manager. And then we're going to hit add and this will add me as a user. Now before it takes effect, you have to hit the apply changes and you're going to have to hit apply changes a lot inside of this web GUI. Not sure why, but that's just the way they have it configured. So now finally, let's get to setting the disks up. We're going to go into disk management. And once we open that, you'll see that it doesn't detect any drives at all. So what we want to do is we want to come down here and we want to put um, import disks right here. We want to push the import button, hit OK, and it's going to go ahead and search for new disks that have been added to the system. And there we go. And as always, we have to hit apply changes for it to take effect. And there we go. Now it's all applied. So then the next thing that we're going to want to do is go to hard drive format. We want to format these hard drives so that we can use them inside of a ZFS pool. So we click hard drive format, click the top one. It'll select all the drives available. Or if you want to format these drives separately, you could also check them separately. So you want to pick what type of format you want to do, whether it be software RAID or ZFS pool. I'm going to do ZFS and then we're going to hit next. For the volume label, I'm going to choose storage, which you can name this anything you want, and then hit next, and then push the format button. And it's going to go through and format the drives now. All right, from here, just hit OK now that it's done. And now we want to go back to hard drive management, and we should be able to verify the file system right here is ZFS pool on all four of these drives. All right, so now the next thing we want to do is click on disks and go to ZFS right here in the menu. And from there, obviously we have no pools set up, but before we set up a pool in management, we have to actually set up the virtual device. And to do that, we click on virtual device right here. And we go ahead and hit the little plus on the corner right here. And we're going to give our virtual device a name. So I'm going to name it storage. And then I'm going to select all the drives. And now here's where you want to actually decide what type of RAID array that you want. Now you could have it just a stripe across all four drives so you don't use, lose any of the data. However, this is really dangerous because if one drive fails, you lose all the data that's on the system. You could do a mirror, which essentially just mirrors everything together, which in this situation probably wouldn't be the most 
efficient use of space. However, what you could also do in this situation is we got RAID Z1 and RAID Z2. And the way this works is RAID Z1 will give you a single point of failure. So if one hard drive fails, you can still recover. You can still replace that drive, rebuild the array, and not lose your data. In the case of RAID Z2, you can actually lose two hard drives be before you lose your data. So depending on which level of redundancy that you want, it's kind of a trade-off too, because right now we have four one terabyte drives. If we go to Z1, we're going to lose one of those drives for the redundancy. So we'll only have a three terabyte total array. If we go to RAID Z2, we're going to lose two drives. So we're only going to have two terabytes of total space. So I'm going to choose Z1 for mine because I like to live dangerously. And typically, my file servers are backed up to the cloud as well. So I don't rely on the file server itself to be my form of backup. I actually have the file server backed up. And for me, it's more important to have more usable space than it is to have more redundancy. So we're going to go ahead and click RAID Z1 and then hit OK. And then hit Apply Changes. And there we go, we have our virtual device set up. Now we're gonna click on management and we're gonna set up management for that device. We're gonna click the little plus sign right here. And we're gonna give it a name. I'm gonna do same thing. We're gonna pick storage and then we're gonna leave everything else default. And then we're gonna go ahead and click on our virtual device that we wanna have managed and then hit add. And at this point, we just push the apply changes button and we should be good to go. And there we go. We have a 3.98 terabyte array with 3.98 terabytes free. Now, unfortunately, the way that RAID Z1 works is that your free space isn't necessarily the free space that you're actually going to have. It's a really weird calculation, and so I wouldn't trust this figure too much because honestly you're actually not going to have 3.9 terabytes of usable space you're only going to have roughly about two and a half terabytes once everything is said and done but anyway we're going to go into here and i'm going to show you how to set up a share now so you can actually use the storage from a computer so from there what we're going to want to do is go into services and go into smb this is the samba sharing right here this is for windows and go ahead and select that so now the first thing that we're going to want to do is go ahead and click the edit button at the bottom so we can actually edit this page. And then once we hit that, we're going to go ahead and change the host name. I'm going to change it from Exigma NAS because honestly, I can't even pronounce it. So I'm not going to be able to spell it when I need to. So I'm going to change this to server. Um, you can change the work group if you want. I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to leave it the way it is and then scroll down to the bottom. And most of these, if you leave them default, it should be fine. So go ahead and hit apply. And then again, hit the apply changes button. And now you're going to want to push the enable button because if you don't hit enable, it won't actually enable the Samba server. So once it's enabled, then we can go over to this next tab for shares. We have to set up a share now. And from here, we're going to go ahead and click the little plus sign. And then for the share name, I'm just going to call it storage. Um, for the comment, I'm just same thing call it storage. And then for the path, we want to go ahead and hit these little lines right here, these little dots right here. And it's going to open up this little window and we're going to want to pick our storage right here. So this is the directory that we want for our storage. This, this is our array right here. So we're going to hit OK now. And now we want to scroll down. And for the most part, you should be able to leave all these parameters default and it should be OK. And we're going to hit Add. And then again, hit Apply Changes. All right, so from that point, we should have a functioning file server. So now let's test to see if it works. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize Chrome, and I'm going to open up our file browser. All right, so from here, I'm going to click on this PC, and I'm going to go over to Computer and hit Map Network Drive. And from here, you want to hit backslash backslash server backslash storage. And there we go. We now have a shared network drive. And if we look at this drive, we can see 
that we have 2.55 terabytes free. Now that's probably a closer estimate to the actual storage space that we really have. So we have four one terabyte drives. One of those drives is gonna be lost to redundancy. So that's gonna leave us with three terabytes. And then we got about a half a terabyte of the file association tables and things of that nature for the format of the drives themselves. So we're, we're gonna be expected to lose some of that data for just housekeeping that the drive needs to make on its own. So other than that, that's how you would go ahead and set up a file server for your network. It's not really hard, and all of the components that I use to do this are relatively easily found in swap meets or something to that effect, or you can even find an old computer that a friend might have that you can use to do this exact same thing with. You know, when I set up the idea to do this video, I literally just dug through computers that I had sitting on the floor to find one that was suitable to use. And unfortunately, that one had a bad network card in it, so I ended up salvaging a motherboard from another computer that had a good network card. So honestly, it's really easy to set up an old, used, broken down computer and repurpose it into something that you can use that actually has some kind of function that's worthwhile rather than just, you know, collecting dust in your garage. So before we go, I just wanted to share with you that I also have a website at cybercputech.com where I share all the show notes from all of these videos. And soon I'll be selling the shirts that I wear on these videos videos on my site. However, in the meantime, you can always see a link to the shirt that I'm wearing in these videos in the description of each video below. Also, follow me on social media. I have a Twitter at CyberCPU, as well as Instagram at CyberCPU as well. And if this video was helpful, then please like this video and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified of future videos. I post a new video every week. Hey, and before you go, Check out some of these videos here. Have a good day.